darkness gone, and the darkness has covered the earth. But His Spirit still dwells, He speaks, it is well, and the hopeless He'll offer new birth. He will break the leash of death, it will have no sting. Let the prisoners go free, we will join us.
the ancient of days and worthy of all
husband and I have talked about the length of our worship time. And he said, you know, during this time, one of the things that brings people so much assurance and comfort is singing and music. So that's why it's a little longer. It's to try to minister to you and to give you just a little time to be able to bask in the presence of the Lord. We're having to do away with so many other things, but this is one thing we can lengthen and it's okay. singing very low very beautiful singing and he was saying well I can see that the costs have gone up again and it's going to take more out of my pocket but he was singing it in a beautiful melody and I turned around a man by himself he was handicapped but absolutely made your spine just quiver. It was so beautiful. And I turned around and I said, you have a gorgeous voice. And he said, well, thank you. He said, you know, there's no reason for me to be upset about this because there's nothing I can do about it. But he was singing. That tells you how we comfort ourselves is by singing. Through the ages, they've done that. So when we say, turn your eyes upon Jesus, we could say that, or we can sing it. And it's so much more effective, isn't it? So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for. this with me because he says he'll come where there's two or three that worship him in spirit and truth I exalt thee
spoken word of our mouth will come. Blessed be your Hallelujah. name, Lord. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. At the end of our service this morning, we're going to have communion. If you did not pick up a communion cup, they are in the foyer, and we want you to be able to have that when the time comes. You're welcome to get up at any time and go get that this morning. Thank you for your help in worship today. It's good to praise the Lord, isn't it? The prophet Isaiah, in the 42nd chapter of the book of Isaiah, identifies an historical problem with the nation of Israel that continues to be a problem even to this day for mankind. And in the 42nd chapter of Isaiah, he begins to say something about our ability to hear and to see. Verse 18 of the 42nd chapter of Isaiah. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His eyes are open, but he does not hear. Verse 22, but this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plundered with none to rescue, spoil with none to say, restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunders? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, in whose ways they would not walk, and whose laws they would not obey. Take a note this morning that God will not force anyone to do what is right. He will not force anyone to do what is right. But we must be very aware that he will hold us accountable for the choice that we make. God will never force a nation or a people or this world or you as an individual to do what is right. But he will hold us accountable for the choices that we make. Verse Uh, Chapter 43 says, But thou, uh, thus saith the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. So there's a declaration that the Lord is saying, not only to the people of Israel, but because of Christ, He says to the world today, He has paid the price for our redemption. If you're wondering who's going to make a difference, God has already made a difference. Who's going to rescue us? God has already set us free, broke the chains that would imprison us, opened the prison doors that we could walk free if we would choose to. If we are bound today, if we are feeling imprisoned, if we are feeling shut off and closed off, This is not of the Lord's work. This is not God's desire. For he sent Christ to the earth, not only to die in our stead. 
and shed his blood for our sin. But in his triumphal rise on the morning of the third day, he showed us that he broke the chains and the bars of sin, death, hell, and the grave. Nothing can hold us. Amen, church. He says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are mine, says the Lord. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. Fear not, I am with you. <laughs> I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the rest I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. Let go of my people. <laughs> and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. God calls us to be free. God broke the chains that could prohibit us or limit us. He opened the prison doors, church. The things that in your heart and mind seem to be in your way are imaginary. The Bible says there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. There is no one and nothing that can pluck you or take you out of his hand. Amen, church. In our mind, with all that's going on, we must remember that in Christ, we are more than conquerors. We are more than overcomers. Amen. We are victorious through the blood of Jesus Christ and the word of our testimony. Verse 4 of 43, Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I want that to sink into your heart today. Sometimes our significance wanes with all that's going on. With the fact that we can't snap our fingers or speak a command or uh, come up with the resource or have the wisdom or the understanding to fix things. It seems as though our significance is waning. Some of us who are growing older, it seems as though our effect and significance is waning. That may be true in the flesh, but in the spirit, through Christ, through his promises, through the power of the word and the power of Christ's blood and the power and the authority of Christ's spirit. Amen, church. We are able, <laughs> we are able to be victorious, to overcome, to triumph. In the name of the Lord. Can you say praise God for that this morning? He said that he, no one can take us out of his hand. Verse 13. Also henceforth I am he. There is none can deliver you from my hand. I work. And who can stop it? Who can limit what God can do? <laughs> his grace has no limit. His Power has no limit. Amen. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you could ask or think. Verse 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel. And I want to introduce to you a thought that is the theme of the message. That God is our way maker. God is our way maker. We're looking for a way through this dark time. We're looking for a way through the circumstances that we face. We're looking for a way to fix what's going on. I want you to know that the Lord has been, He is and He will continue to be the source of our help, of our strength, of our peace, of our victory and of our future joy. Can you say amen? 
He says, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus saith the Lord, verse 16, who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. He's our way maker. Look at that again, verse 16 of chapter 43, Isaiah. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters. You may not see how you're going to navigate what's going on. You may not understand that there is an answer and there is hope. You may not feel in your own self and being and thoughts and emotions and spirit that things are going to work out. But I want you to know that God is our Holy One. He is our Creator. He is the Lord our God. He is our Savior and our Benefactor. He is everything you need him to be. Amen. And anyone, anyone, say it with me, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If we call upon him in our hour of need, he will not turn us away. He will not deny us. He will not fail us. He will come through. He makes a way in the seas of our life, in the mighty waters and the storms and the circumstances that we face as individuals and as family. God is a way maker. God is the way maker. Amen. Verse 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The Lord is saying, you may not have been able to see or imagine that there's an answer. You may not see that there's hope on the horizon. You may be in a desert place and uh, nothing can quench your thirst, but the Lord said he will make rivers in the desert and a way in the wilderness. And he doesn't say that we're going to make it or doctors are going to make it or leaders are going to make it. He says, I'll take this upon myself. I will do it myself for my people because I have loved you with an everlasting love and I will never abandon you. I will never fail you. God cannot do that. Amen. He said, I will make a way. He's our way maker. Can you say praise God for that? Verse 22, you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. Just think of that. We haven't, we haven't been as faithful to God as he has been to us. No generation has. But God says he will not fail us. Amen. He loves us. Amen, church. Say thank you, Lord. That despite of who I am and what I have and have not done, you still love me. Thank you, Lord. He says, you didn't call upon me and you've been weary of me. How many have been weary of dealing with all the things that you have to do and then you have to go to church? Then you have to pray and then you have to read scripture and then you have to remember to think right and do right and talk right and then you have to repent when you don't and then you have to and you have to have to and it's kind of like, I'm exhausted from just having to try to be good, try to think right, try to talk right, try to be right. We've all had those feelings of this is exhausting humanly. In our flesh, it's overwhelming. And he identifies that. Verse 23, Old Testament. You brought me your sheep and your burnt offerings. You have not brought those to me like you should have. You have not honored me with your sacrifices. If we look at verse 24, You have brought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices. So when we look at what we've done, how how have we compared to what God has done? How do we compare with what we have done? And he says, you haven't really done anything. You have not been faithful with your sacrifices. And here he's talking to Israel. But I would submit to you as a nation As a nation, America has not been as faithful as we could have been. We have not honored God as we could have and should have. The people in the news detract from the Lord. Many in our nation are turning away from right and faith and morality 
and just unleashing evil in every corner and in every space of our world. And God identifies that, that mankind has historically had that problem. We get enamored with the things of our own desire and lust, and we abandon God. We spend our strength, our energy, and our resource doing things that are material that will not last even a lifetime. And we do not give to God as we could and we should. I think we're as guilty as Israel was in the day of Isaiah the prophet. But verse 25, he comes back. He says, all that is true. And you know it's true. I know it's true. But verse 25, I am he who blots out your transgressions. God is a God who forgives and forgets. He does not hold the past against us. When we commit it to the Lord in prayer and repentance, he says it will never be remembered from his perspective. It'll never be brought up again. All that as a nation and as a people, as Christians, we could come to the place where we could forgive That in itself is huge. It is a hill too far for most people to truly forgive. But even when we do that, it is almost never that we forget. In our humanness, we struggle with the enemy throwing things up in our mind. Things coming back that continue to wound even though they are decades old. Think of it, church. And yet the Lord says, I am he who blots this out. I know what has happened in the past. I know who you are as a people. He says that even to the Gentile generations of this day that we're living. But he will blot out our transgressions for his own sake. And I will not remember your sins. So we have a starting point. Once we understand that, God's not going to hold grudges. God's not going to enumerate where we've come short. God's not going to pick the scab of our existence. He will forgive us and he will not remember it. Amen, church. Chapter 44, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Verse three, for I will pour water on a thirsty land streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. Now, why would God speak to Isaiah and tell Israel, tell them I know what they've done. I know what they are even doing. And I know what they didn't do that they could have and should have. If God is a God who forgives and forgets and people on the extreme left who do not really believe in God or follow scripture or honor the Lord, and I believe that to be true for the most part. God is not picking and finding fault. He is saying, I want you to know that I know that because the first thing that your flesh, the world, and the devil is going to do is find fault. They can't come up with an answer, a solution, or the remedy. So all they can do is find fault with everybody else. How many see that in our world? They can't do anything right or good, and they will pick at finding fault with anything and everyone that's making the effort. God does not leave us in that mentality. But again and again, how many have seen chapter 43, 42, 43, 44? God is saying, I know this, and I know that people and your own memory and Satan, the accuser, is going to come and tell you there is no hope. Look at who you are and what you are and how you have failed to do what God would have you to do. 
God's not going to help you. But all through 42, 43, and 44, God is continuing to say, I'm still God. You're still my children. I still love you. I will not fail you. I have forgiven you. I have redeemed you. I have broke the chains and opened the doors. Come out of your sin. Come out of your darkness. Come out of your despair. For I love you. You are my children. I'm calling you. I broke the chains, taken the handcuffs off, opened the prison doors, broken down the walls and the barriers. Come home. Hallelujah. Come home. He said to the north, let go. Come home. Amen. Hallelujah. He wants his people to know that he loves you. That doesn't matter what you have or have not done. To him, he loves you. That's what matters. He has paid the price to redeem you, to forgive you, and he's not going to remember those things that you remember and other people won't forget. And Satan is going to continue to remind you of how bad and how weak and how short you fall. Come on, church. How many can just give a hallelujah to the Lord our God? Isn't he awesome? Hallelujah. He says, I will pour water upon the thirsty land, verse 3 of 44. Streams in the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. This is God talking not only to Israel, but he's talking to us. What are we going to do? Satan comes and things will happen. Decisions are made. Loved ones, children, grandchildren, things going on that creates such anxiety, such concern. We're overwhelmed. The burden becomes so heavy that it crushes right, life right out of us and the joy of life rips it right out of our spirit. And what are we going to do? And the Lord says, I want you to know that I've not rede- only redeemed you and forgiven you and forgotten your sin, but I'm going to pour my spirit upon your descendants. <laughs> I have not abandoned you as my seed, nor will abandon your seed, for I, the Lord your God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at what verse 6 says. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. There is no one else, but I am God, and I am going to help you. Amen. Verse 8, fear not, nor be afraid. I Have I not told you from old and declared it? And you are my witness. Is there any God besides me? There is no other rock but our God. There is no other foundation but our God. Amen. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Never give up praying. And when you pray, keep alert and be thankful. Be sure to pray that God will make a way for us. Be sure to pray that God will make a way for us. Amen. How many can say there are moments, sometimes they turn into hours and days and weeks, sometimes even months, that we have wanted, needed, desired hoped for, even prayed for, and yet it seems as though things don't turn better. They seem to turn worse sometimes. But I want you to know that in the season of the harvest, in the season of the harvest, God will always have someone to enter the harvest field to labor the harvest that is ready. Amen. There are seasons of life. We all go through them. Amen. We're all in a season. And there are seasons for planting, seasons for resting the field, seasons for uh, reaping the harvest. There are storms that come and damage or destroy the harvest for a season. But then there's another season to plant. And God will always have seed and he will always have planters and he will always have a harvester. Jesus is coming back to harvest the seed of souls that was planted in the beginning of creation. Amen? That Satan tried to destroy, that our flesh and the world has tried to undermine and compromise, but God is going to send Christ back to the earth 
because he is our redeemer and he will not fail us. Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 and chapter 16, verse 25 of Proverbs. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way to death. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way that leads to death. We need to go back to Colossians 4, 2 and 3. Never give up praying. And when you pray, keep alert and be thankful. Verse 3, be sure to pray that God will make a way. Not man's way. Not a way that's going to lead us to death and destruction. But a way that's going to lead us to victory and to eternal life. Can you say amen? Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 6. For there is a time and a way. This is important. Ecclesiastes 8, 6. There is a time and a way for everything. Although man's troubles lies heavy on him. That's an important verse. How many have some anxiety? Some trouble in your heart, your mind. Some dark despair. Some wondering, overwhelming feelings. Ecclesiastes 8.6 There is a time and a way for everything. How many have ever thought, felt, or heard there's no way it's going to work out? There's no hope. There's no way that this can be fixed. There's no way that this can turn around. Ecclesiastes 8.6 for there is a time and a way for everything. God is a way maker. And in his time, in his time, Ecclesiastes 8 says, for there is a time. Are you with me? In his time, he makes all things beautiful. Verse 16 of Isaiah 42, he says, I will lead the blind in a way that they don't know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. Do you receive that this morning, church? You need it. Share it with your family. Share it with your neighbors and friends when they feel overwhelmed and despair and things in life go wrong and turn dark and storms arise and decimate and destroy. Take Isaiah 42. I will lead the blind. They can't see a way. They can't understand how anything good can happen. I will lead them in a way that they don't know, in paths that they've not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do. God's talking. Amen. This is the English Standard Version, but it's a powerful verse. Amen. God says, this is what I will do. When you say, wonder what this person's going to do, what they're going to do, and wonder what, how I'm going to respond and how I can handle this. God says, all that's uh, really there, but it's not what you need to focus on. Focus on the things that only God can do. He is the only true God. He is the only rock that we can anchor to and stand on. And he is the only one that can make a way where there is no way. Amen. Can you say amen, church? Isaiah 35, verse 8 to 10, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, for it shall be, it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be, no ravenous beast shall go thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. The redeemed shall walk there. Who's going to be on that road? Israel, he says, you haven't been good, guys. You've rebelled against me. You've failed, and you know it. You feel unworthy. And when you come into my presence, you're going to feel like God's not going to hear me and answer me. Satan's going to jump on your shoulder and down in your heart and tell you, you're worthless. God's not going to hear your prayer. 
You've, you've failed, you've come short, you haven't done your best, and he's going to come to you, and God says, no, 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 I have redeemed you. You are mine, and I'm calling you out of the prison places in your mind, in your heart, and in the realities of your life, place where you feel shut off and isolated, place where you feel abandoned. God says, I'm calling you. I'm calling you back home. And I'm going to bless you and I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to forget all these things. You just need to get up and come home. See, there's the key. You can sit in the prison cell and not even realize that the lock is unlocked. You can continue to lay there burdened with chains that are laying around you, your neck and your hands and your arms. Sometimes they're just mental thoughts that defeat you, discourage you. Sometimes they're real. How you've been put in a place where there's no margin for you to move forward. There's no ability to rise up. I want you to know if God can rain down manna for 40 years to a rebellious people because he didn't want them to starve to death. And they were literally too lazy and too rebellious to try to care for themselves. They were just busy murmuring and complaining against leadership and against God calling them out. At least they had a place to stay even though it wasn't really warm or safe. At least they had onions and clove and, and garlic that they could eat and uh, they felt safe in their bondage. And yet the Lord, when he came and he said to Moses, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses himself says, who am I that he would listen to me? See, Moses felt in prison because he knew he had murdered two Egyptians and he knew that the grandson of the man who was in authority when he did that now was ruling and the family knew it. And if he went back, he could be in prison or killed. He had mental bondages. But the Lord says, I'm calling you out of the backside of the desert to go back because my people are in bondage. And I want them to know that because of who I am, they cannot be kept and imprisoned. And he went through all the things that God went through to turn the heart of Pharaoh to him. He said, we'll pay you to leave. Take some of our gold. Take the livestock. Take these things and just go, go, go. <laughs> he set them free. But then they got in this mentality that they felt imprisoned. And they'd rather go back to being slaves and beaten than to be out here with the potential of ruling and reigning in their own land, in a land that flowed with milk and honey. Can you imagine that? I'm trying to get you to realize that has been repeated in every generation of mankind. It wasn't just Israel. Our world today, we here in America and around the world are fighting this same horrible spiritual, mental, emotional, physical battle. And the Lord is saying, I want you to open your eyes. Look, I've opened the prison door. Look, the chains are not secure. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up your holy hands and praise God for he has set us free. Hallelujah. Amen, church. He's made a way. Hallelujah. The ransomed of the Lord, verse 10, Isaiah 35, shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. How often have you just went, just exhausted overwhelmed and the Lord saying I'm going to pep you up I'm going to give you a song I'm going to shake off the heaviness and bring you to a place of rejoicing Isaiah 43 16 the Lord is the one who makes a way in the sea of life in the path 
of the mighty waters. <coughs> He's the way maker. He said, I'm going to do a new thing. Amen. I'm going to make a way even in the mountains of life. In the steep places. In the rocky places. And my highway will be exalted. Behold, Isaiah 49, 12. These shall come from afar and those, these from the north and from the west and these from the land of Sinem. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and I will have mercy upon the afflicted. God will have mercy upon the afflicted. 